Uh, and watching the video, you know, you'll take a look and maybe you can contribute. Um, we also have our, of course, our enterprise side of things. Um, we have Quay, which is our container registry um, product, both on-prem and hosted. Um, we'll show some uh, details of that today, as well as uh, Tectonic, which is our on-prem um, enterprise Kubernetes um, system. And of course, we're hiring all departments. Uh, this includes the New York City. We are the New York base team. So if you're interested, please let us know. Uh, a little more background. Uh, Quentin and I are on the Quay Container Registry team. Um, Quay is, as the name implies, a container registry for Docker and ECI and some OCI images. Um, you can push and pull your images, manage the ECLs, um, download them in a variety of formats, um, and other things such as security scheme, which we'll be talking about. So, getting started. Um, the big question why is container security a problem? I'm sure a lot of us have some good answers to this question, but let's you know, deep dive in a bit. Um, if we look at traditional deployments before containers, <coughs> there was a fairly clean separation as to who was responsible for um, one half of the stack versus the other. So ops people would be traditionally responsible for the operating system itself, the kernel, your init system, maybe SSH. Um, if there's any vulnerabilities in these portions of the operating system, they would perform the upgrades. And similarly, the ops people were in general responsible for the packages installed in these operating systems as well, Python, Java, Nginx. While developers were primarily concerned with the applications, um, although they would have absolute requirements on which packages were available on their system. Um, Moving forward a bit, we start to see a little bit of a clash in this area around, well, an a developer might say, I need Python 3.3 for um, to be installed on my systems, while the ops people say, no, I need to do an upgrade because there's a security hole in this package or amongst other packages. So we started to see a little more friction um, develop in this area and not very many great solutions except for you know rolling deploys and lots and lots of testing. <coughs> Containerized deployment actually uh, moved the separation concern and established new clear lines. Now, developers were responsible for the versions of the packages that they were running because the packages themselves were contained within the container images. So for example, app A may have Java installed. Whatever version the developer felt they needed at the time, app B may have Python. Um, while the operating system itself was still at the under the purview of the ops person. And in fact, we can see that App A may have one version of Java, say Java 7, while App C could have a completely different version of Java, say Java 8. And there's no conflict here. You can have whatever versions of whatever packages you want within your container images, and they won't conflict. And so now, as a developer, you get more control over how you move your package versions forward. However, while being great from the perspective of uh, maintainability, um, it introduced some additional problems. So first, in practice, we don't just have Java 8, just Python inside of our containers. Most of our containers are, in fact, a whole slew of packages a whole that we're building on top of. So if we've ever built on, say, the you know, Ubuntu base image, even if you're building on, say, Alpine, you're still getting basically part of a kernel. You're getting perhaps an init system, maybe SSHD, and then you have a whole set of other packages inside of your containers. And this, in fact, leads to the reality that for most people, containers are, in fact, opaque, um, especially if you're going to be running multiple microservices on the same machines, and those services are maintained or managed by different developers. Um, this is, in fact, even worse if you're using just random base images to create your code. So let's say you're using the Golang on-build image from the Docker Hub. Um, fairly simple, right? You're just going to do a, a go build, right? Seems like it should be fairly simple and have not have too much in it. Um, but you don't actually know what's in that image. I mean, you could probably use some effort and try to figure it out, but who knows what's in that image, what vulnerabilities they may have, and what may be introduced into your running stack when you push the image that you've built uh, using that base image. So, you know, this is a problem in the abstract, but realistically, why is this an issue, right? I mean, Software has problems, but is it really that much of a, of a big problem overall? Uh, yeah. Um, and if we look at a, you know, just an overview of the number of vulnerabilities reported over time, we can see that you know, the last couple of years, we've seen significant spikes, um, and we're trending again this year, um, to significant overall security vulnerability counts being very high. 
Um, of course, 2014 was pretty crazy, nearly 8,000 reported vulnerabilities, but even last year, over 6,000, we're, we're looking at a large problem. And in fact, it's gone so bad that we have the reality now of branded vulnerabilities. So this is, of course, you know, a whole new idea. Like, we're actually putting marketing effort now behind our vulnerabilities to get the word out to people to say, hey, look, something's wrong. So, first of all, does anyone know what this vulnerability is? Ghost. Ghost, yeah. CVE 2015-0235, aka Ghost. Fairly innocuous sounding, but it's a buffer overflow and get host by name that pretty much allows a remote attacker to do anything they want on your machine. That's very, very, very scary. Um, how about this one? Heartbleed, that 24 hours where we were all patching our systems in a frenzy. CV 2014-0160. Not too bad, right? It just you know, memory leak of keys in OpenSSL. So now we're all rotating everything. The reality is that as of today, um, there are over 76,000 reported vulnerabilities in the NVD database. And this is just the reported ones. Lord knows how many unreported ones are lurking in underneath our code. Um, so this is a big, big problem. So between the fact that our container images are fairly opaque and the fact that security vulnerabilities are getting, it seems, almost worse by the day, we have a real problem. And the real question is, how can we improve this situation? And we at CoreOS actually asked ourselves this. So the answer we came up with is, let's inspect our container images, find out what's inside, and hopefully identify these problems before they become, you know, an article in a newspaper about how, you know, our systems got compromised. But how do we do so, and how do we do so at scale? Which is always a big question for us at CoreOS. So a little more context to show why this is just not a simple problem. Um, so the, the query hosted registry contains millions of images that can have vulnerabilities in them. You know, it's not a small set by any means. Running container images can be highly insecure. I mean, any of these vulnerabilities could also cause a breakage at the side of the container itself. Not to mention the fact that that doesn't handle the case where the container images may actually have honestly got malware in them. At the very least, running them could start spam bots. We're not really sure if we can run these in a secure way. And of course, analyzing these images should be as fast as possible. We should be able to get from you know, CVE announced to actionable intelligence about our images as quickly as we can. If the turnaround time on this is even more than a few hours, we're potentially vulnerable. And so we should try to minimize this whenever possible. And of course, finally, and this is uh, something we feel very strongly about at CoreOS, we feel open source of this kind of technology is key. One of CoreOS's uh, goals is to help secure the internet. And so we feel very strongly that any security-related technology that we can make available should be available to the world and publicly audited, therefore allowing us all to help increase the security, not even necessarily if you're using CoreOS's paid products. So to that end, we created a project called Claire. It's an open source project for the analysis of vulnerabilities in both AppC and Docker containers. Um, as OCI becomes more standardized as well, we'll add support for that as well. Um, it's available today on github.com slash core slash Claire um, for analyzing container images for vulnerabilities. It makes use of static analysis for fast reproducible results. Um, we're gonna go a little more into why we feel this is very important, but at the top level, it basically allows us to go over sets of millions of images and when it is available very quickly. And Another key aspect is that it's extensible to allow for easy addition of new things such as new analyzers, new reporters, image formats. This means that every time, or any time rather, say we want to support a new distro, it's pretty easy to add a new um, uh, reporter or analyzer to do so. So enough about talking about it, let's actually see that. And uh, to do a cool demo and talk more about the technical underpinnings, I'm gonna hand over to my coworker, Quentin. Quentin? Hi. Uh, so before I'm going any further, I would like to show you a demo. Uh, okay. 
Voilà. So I would like to do a demo through our integration with Quay. Uh, so about a month ago, I found an Nginx image online, uh, and I could simply have deployed this, this image to get my web server running. It would have taken me a couple seconds, right? But I was not actually sure of what this image was, so I decided to instead push it to my to Quay and see what Claire can say about this image. So here we are on my local instance of Quay. Uh, we can head to the text page, and we, we have the latest tags, and we have a security column. So I'm going to just click on this, and have a report. So interestingly, <laughs> this small Nginx image contains over 600 varieties, and this is quite uh, terrifying. <laughs> so by scrolling down, we can see some very, very cool stuff, like OpenSSL varieties. Introduce that container because I opened SSL in version 1.0.1.j1, whatever that can mean. Uh, we can actually see more details. So here we can learn that anybody can exploit this variety uh, over the network without authentication. It's very easy to exploit, and that might impact my confidentiality and integrity completely. We also have a small description here. Uh, describing the variety, we may learn more by clicking on the link to, uh, to the upstream variety, on which we have a bunch of references. Uh, we also have cross references with the other distributions that claim this variety. Uh, and what is interesting here, we can see that this uh, variety can be fixed by upgrading OpenSSL to that version, which is not very far away. We also learned that this, uh, it has been introduced in my image through this comment, which doesn't sound like so terrifying at the first glance, but anyways. And actually, if we look at the top of the page, we can see that over 400 of these varieties can be patched. So that means that this image is probably quite old. Um, there is something way more interesting about this image. If we keep scrolling, I don't know if I will find it immediately. But okay, I can filter it. I know what I'm looking for. Alright. What you see here? We have a variety introduced by MySQL in that image. Why the hell do I have MySQL in that Nginx image? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's take a moment. Alright. So I wanted to have a look. Uh, at everything that can be included in that image. So I will head to the second view, right here, and we have a list of all the detected packages and features on that image. Uh, we'll, of course, find MySQL again, right here. Uh, we, have, we also find OpenSSL, for instance. Oh, there are a bunch of stuff there, Git, um, yeah. SQLite, Subversion. Well, that makes more sense, <laughs> So what's more interesting about this page is that we can actually see the impact that upgrading all our features and packages to the latest version may have. So for instance, by upgrading open cells to the latest version, I will remove uh, seven high variety and 19 additional ones, like lower ones. Right? So I should probably upgrade open cells to the latest version right now. I should probably also remove all like the packages that are used that right in MySQL over the heck. Yes. So once I fixed everything and I feel comfortable with my image, I obviously don't want to come back on that page because I'm way too lazy and too busy doing stuff. So what I'm gonna do is setting up a notification in the setting page. Alright, so create notification. You're gonna tell me when everything blows up. Uh, you're gonna tell me when a, a variety is found. I'm only interested in, like, let's say, high critical and difficult varieties. And you're gonna send me a local website notification. You might also send me like Slack notifications, or webhook, or emails. But for the purpose of this demo, we're just gonna use this thing. Tech. Okay. Now, what I'm gonna do is create a vulnerability on my local running there. So to do this, I'm going to use the API. Here we go. So, oh, 
Okay, that's the table. Table. There we go. And in a couple of seconds after refreshing this page, okay, I have a notification right here telling me that there is a new critical parameter in my image. So that happens each time Claire updates itself. That's pretty cool. If we go back to the text page, we can see that there is a new critical parameter right here. And we'll find it in the report. Here. Spooky unicorn. All right. So again, this is only our integration of Claire on Quay, right? So you can do the same thing and basically everything using the Claire API. So actually, let's get this link. I'm going to show you how can I get the exact same information using the API. So I'm just going to use curl. Um, there we go. Probably have to filter it. Um, right, there we go. So yeah, we have some metadata of the image, uh, and then we have all the parameters uh, by package. So fetch pull up, let me find something. Sorry about that. Oh yeah, here, for instance, we know that graphite 2 has been installed in that image by this layer. And this, has, this is Debian 8, we installed it with this version. And here is the list of all of these parameters. Right. Uh, we have the description, the link, uh, we have some metadata about the vectors, uh, the severity, and then you have the fixed version right here. So if I upgrade my packet, this is currently in version 124 to 136, then I'm going to fix this protocol of variety. <coughs> Any questions so far? Okay. Cool. So, how did we exactly did that, right? So when you stop clear, and then periodically clear is gonna pull parameters from external databases. Uh, clear tries to use first-party databases as much as possible, such as the Debian trackers, Ubuntu trackers, and Red Hat uh, adversaries, for instance. Uh, this is because we believe that they are closer to the maintainers. And these guys have particular and specific knowledge about information details, of all the backports, etc. For instance, actually two weeks ago, I found a Java variety. Uh, uh, yeah, I found a Java variety, and that variety was not affecting Debian. And why is that? Is that this variety has been introduced was introduced by a patch to a previous variety, right? But that patch was not yet merged into uh, Debian upstream. Right, so Debian was still vulnerable to the first variety, but not vulnerable to the second one. But most other tools will have reported both. But actually, because we are using very uh, like specific databases, we were able to be as specific as this. So when we pull, after pulling this, this the databases, we're going to parse them and store them into the clear database. Uh, in that case, we are using Postgres. In a very early prototype, we were actually using a graph database. So it's, I guess six months ago, we gave a presentation at Container Days and we were using a graph database, but it was way too slow for our, our usage. So now we are using Postgres with recursive queries. Uh, we are very happy about it. Uh, yeah. Once Clear knows about all the properties, we may start analyzing images, right? So what we'll typically do is pushing an image to your registry. Uh, in the case of my demo, it was Quay. And then the registry is going to ask Claire to analyze these images. It's going to do it using the Claire API. And it's going to analyze images layer by layer. Uh, as you may know, Docker containers are made of layers. And by analyzing these images layer by layer, we are actually able to skip the analysis of all the layers that we already saw. Right? So we are saving a lot of time here. Then the API is going to pass these layers to the worker. 
and the worker is going to give these layers to all our different detectors. So we have three kinds of detectors. The first one is a data detector. Uh, this, this data detectors are supposed to uh, extract the static contents from images depending on their image format. So may that be Docker images, AppC images, OpenVZ images, or just here to extract the data from them. And then we're going to pass this data to the feature detectors. And these ones are the most important ones. So we're going to extract anything that they can possibly find in that image. Uh, may that be uh, packages, configuration elements, keys, etc. Basically everything that could lead to having varieties. And finally, we have the namespaces detector. And this is to create a context between what we, uh, which feature we detected and the operating systems, basically. That, I mean, okay, so it's to draw a context between the detected features and the varieties. So for instance, this is saying that I installed OpenSSL as a detected in my feature detector, but I installed it for Ubuntu 8 and not Debian, for instance, right? So it's, it's helping clear to understand which variant database should look for. And finally, we're going to store uh, all the data that we found about this image into our data store for each of the layers again. And now, from this point, we actually have all we need. And we can actually open our registry, for instance, or use the API to know which parameters may affect my images, and what can be fixed, and how can they be fixed. All right, so here, there is no active action. We're just going to ask the API, and it's going straight to the database. There is no analysis at this point. We've already done the analysis before. So this is very, very fast. But now we have to. We, we know that there are over 50 new varieties each day, and this is not even counting all the updates that occur on the existing varieties. Right? So we have to ask ourselves: What are, are we going to do? Are we going to reanalyze every single image that we analyzed before? Of course, we are not going to do this, right? So instead, we are going to exploit the immutable nature of images. So what we knew about the static content of an image when we analyzed it was true. It's still true, and it's going to be true in the future as well, because this is static data, and images are not supposed to be modified, right? So instead, when Clear uh, creates, uh, uh, when Clear updates itself, we're going to match the new variety uh, data with the knowledge that we have about our images, right? So we have a new variety these packages or these features, then I'm going to ask the data store which image actually has this feature, right? And we, in which version do they have it? And so as I will be able to And then we're going to use the notifiers to send these notifications back to the clients, for instance, the registry. In our case, it was Quay on the demo. Uh, so for instance, that could be, oh, well, there is a new variety. Right, and this is a list of all the images that are, that are affected by it. Or there was a remedy; it has been updated. We know that it's now fixed in this version. So uh, all the images that are installing a v are installing a version that is like later than this version are not actually vulnerable, even though we thought initially. Right, so we're gonna tell the reader about this. So this is yeah an example of a notification. Um, we have up here the old remedy. Uh, we can see that it's affecting grep uh, of Debian 8, and it's not fixed in any version, as shown here. We also have the list of images that it affects. So of course this is uh, paginated because it could be huge. And here we have the new. Variety, right? So the updated one, and that one we actually see that it's fixed in version 224, 25, sorry. Right? So this is, and it's not affecting one of the images anymore. See, there is one less image right here. This is probably because that image was installing 226, for instance, right? Um, and I think one of the most important thing about Clear, as Joey mentioned, is that you can customize it. You can extend anything at any time without our uh, intervention, right? You, so this, for instance, the data store, you can implement your own database, ba database backend. Uh, if you want to install 
as Bolt, for instance, or I don't know, MySQL, Galera, it doesn't really matter, you can, you can extend it. Uh, you can extend the variety of data if your company have some knowledge about internal varieties, for instance, you can just add yours, basically. Oh, you, can, you can extend the notifiers to have a, like an internal way to send notifications to you. And then you can extend all the detectors. So you can add new image formats, you can add new feature detectors. Uh, if you have to detect your, again, your like, internal applications or com self-compiled uh, software and the namespace detectors. So, as you can see, you can basically extend anything here. Right? It's except the API. And like, mm. um, okay, so here is a list of interfaces that you may want to implement to add new components. So up there, we have fetch update, for instance, and it's simply returning a list of uh, varieties to clear. We also have the notifier, which is even simpler. It just takes a notification and tries to send it to the other party. Uh, and then we have all the detectors, data detector, uh, feature detector, namespace detector. They all have the same method name, detect. Uh, they return different stuff, obviously. And finally, we have this huge one, which is the interface to implement your own data store. So what's next? We'd like to extend our capabilities. We'd like to, to add Alpine Linux support, for instance. They currently do not provide a uh, machine-readable variety database. It's just quite terrible. Oh. If you want, want to see that happen, we have a yeah. Google Go link. Yeah. Go there and uh, add a plus one to the issue. Hopefully, that will convince them to move forward more rapidly. We'd like to implement NPM. Uh, this is actually currently done by Huawei, they are doing an incredible job around this. We'd like to add Python and Wasp. Uh, Clear has been designed to be used by developers and registries, so you have to use it through the API. But as we saw, like a lot of the community when I use it through the command line. So we'd like to add a new command line tool. Uh, there is currently a contribution command line tool, which isn't great. Uh, it's not the best thing out there. It's, it's usable, so you can definitely analyze your local images using this. Uh, there is uh, someone uh, in Belgium actually having a great command line tool. We're looking forward to merge it into the stream. And basically, any, anything you'd like to see, because again, it's open source and you can extend it. That's all we have for today, so thank you so much. Any questions? Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. So in general, this is detecting. It's using upstream databases of vulnerabilities to detect vulnerable packages and tell you which packages fit them. Can it detect unpackaged code in any way? Currently, no. So the the current idea is it's all based on the metadata found in, in, in the images. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you could, as as we alluded to earlier, write a custom detector. So if you have um, say your own internal manifest of what you've added to the image, you could write a feature detector, add it in, and then you can even match it to the existing vulnerability databases or your own if you'd like. We don't do currently hash-based matching. Um, we found that building that database is not trivial in the least, and for an open source project, that's not easy to do. Um, there is discussion on the open source project is one of the issues about adding some additional level of hash-based matching to complement the package level matching as well. A philosophical problem. Yes, um, and of course, even hash-based matching will not stop uh, malicious uh, vulnerability injection because you know always just change your code in some way and the hash will be wrong. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? It looks like you work with Docker and uh, Play Industries. Is that correct? So the open source project itself has just a well-defined REST API, so it can kind of work with anything. There are multiple registries that have done integration already. Uh, Quay is one of them because, of course, we're the Quay team. Um, Huawei also has a, an open source registry called, I believe, Dockyard, and they've done the integration work as well. Um, there are people who are doing integration work with the Docker open source registry. Um, I don't know off the top of my head where that code lies, but it would be fairly trivial to do, I imagine, because the API is well-defined. Anything else? All right. 
Thank you so much.